Hello and welcome to our service today. It's great to have you online with us. We are very honored to have a guest speaker with us today, Pastor Sean Phillips from Urban Ed Church. So we know that you're going to have an amazing time watching the message that he has brought us today. If you are new with us and you would like to find out more about who we are at Revive Church, please go over to our website, revivechurch.co.za. And fill in an online connection card. We can send you answers to any of the questions that you may have and tell you about what's coming up in the life of Revive Church. And please take note of the dates coming up. November 10th, we have baby blessings. And November 24th, we have baptisms. So if you would like to sign up for any one of these, please, again, head on over to our website, revivechurch.co.za. Fill in an online connection card and we will send you all the details that you need. Otherwise, enjoy the service. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad that you guys are here at church today. We have the privilege of having Pastor Sean and Tanya Phillips from Urban Edge Church with us this morning. It's such an honor to have you guys. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have friends come over, but it's also nice to have people who have invested, not just in us personally and in our church, but also in the AOG group over so many years. Uh, you guys have always been so warm and welcoming to us. And uh, that is a real, real blessing to Lara and I. And for many of you people don't know, Sean is actually on our church board and has behind the scenes given such great wisdom and help and perspective into the life of the church and into my life personally. And so we're so grateful that they would have uh, the time to be here today, to make the time to be here today. Uh, Sean is uh, leading the AOG regional region here in the Western Cape. And I'm excited to celebrate with them in two weeks time as they open up officially I think it's like an official opening of their uh, their new brand new auditorium in Pinehurst. Uh, I think it's going to be like 900, and then it's going to open up to over a thousand people. Uh, is that amazing? Come on, hey, that's amazing. So, so this is what I'd like you to do. If you've got any friends in the Durbanville surrounds area, please invite them to Revive Church. <laughs> Make sure you send them to Urban Edge. Uh, it's an absolutely incredible, incredible church led by an incredible team uh, and pastors there. And so please, would you lean forward? Would you welcome Pastor Sean up as he shares God's word with us this morning? Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Oh, you can do better than that. How are you all doing this morning? Come on, winter is over. Summer is here. God is good. Amen. Uh, I, I, I vowed never to talk about winter and summer ever because um, in our church years ago, I used to always say uh, this little phrase. I would say, winter's from the devil, summer's from God. You know, and like I firmly believed it in my spirit, even though I knew theologically that wasn't correct and it probably wasn't a good thing to say. But, you, you know, Sunday after Sunday during winter, I mean, this was the worst winter we've ever had. Come on, can I, can I hear somebody say amen to that? I mean, God bless you for winter, but I love summer. And so I used to say, winter's from the devil, summer's from God, and I used to get our church to repeat it. And then somebody came to me, a, a granny in our church, said, you know, I just want to let you know something that uh, uh, my, my grandchild came to church. The parents don't really go to church, and I brought the grandchild to church, and uh, she loves it, and she's come for a couple of weeks. And the mom asked her the one day after the service, so what did you learn in church? She said, winter's from the devil and summer's from God. <laughs> I'm like, I'll never say that again. So we celebrate winter, we celebrate summer, we celebrate every season in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Some of you don't believe me. Awesome. Well, uh, great privilege to be here, and uh, I've known your pastors for a long time, um, really good people. What are you doing up here? Okay. Um, I, thought, I thought he was going to kick me off here for a moment. And, like, well, I didn't say anything bad yet, but... Um, it's been a wonderful journey and a wonderful journey to see this church grow and to see what God is doing in and through this church. And I always say this, that we must never underestimate what God can do through the, through the ordinary. And sometimes we treat this as ordinary, but God is doing an extraordinary work. And how I love to say to our church is every single Sunday we come here and we go, it's another service, it was a good service, it was a nice service, but somebody's life is going to change forever today. So somebody's going to come to know Jesus today. All over the world, people are getting saved as they come and experience the presence of God. But not just that, lives get transformed. God could speak to you today in a powerful way that could significantly shift the rest of your life. So how many of you know this is not just an ordinary service? It's not an ordinary church. It's not an ordinary day. God is getting ready to do something extraordinary here today. Come on, I need a few more amens 
And uh, uh, you know, I tell our church all the time that as much as you say amen, the shorter I preach. I got all day to preach today. I can teach from Genesis and I can finish at Revelation today. But uh, if you say a whole bunch of amens, I'll make sure that I am on time. Amen. Can you stand to your feet this morning? And um, I like to do this uh, back home because I believe that the Word of God is powerful. It's not a storybook. It's not a fairy tale. It's not another book that's on your bookshelf. But this is God coming to us, revealing Himself to us. And uh, I think today, as we get ready to look at God's Word, we have an amazing opportunity to have God speak to us in a personal way. And so I know that this message is for people, but at the same time, God wants to speak to me individually. Amen? So Philippians chapter 4, and uh, we're going to read four verses today from verse 10. Famous verse in the Bible, Paul's writing, and he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at least you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Him, through Christ, who gives me strength. I want to talk to you today about the secret of contentment. How many of you know we all need a little more contentment in our lives? So come on, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. God, we love to just sit, be in your presence, receive from you. God, I pray today that as I speak your word, God, that it's not just my words, but it's you speaking to us. It's not just some ideas, but it's you transforming us from the inside out. And so I pray that your word will take root in our lives. I pray that you will speak to us by your spirit. God, we are here ready to receive all that you have in store for us. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. Half hour somebody next to you and tell them, I love you. I love you. <laughs> How many of you have ever asked yourself the question, When is enough enough? Ever asked that question? Maybe you've thought of, when is enough enough? It's kind of like, like, you know, I have this thing in my head. Every, every single week, every single month, every single year, I tell myself, Phillips, you've got to do this. I'm going to buy myself a slab of chocolate on a Monday. And that slab is going to last me all week. One row each day of the week. Amen? Seven days eight rows, so there can be a cheat day. One slab, once a week, in Jesus' name. Come on, anybody else with me? You start off on the Monday night, you eat the first row, and there's something in you that cannot stay there. Has anybody else got this struggle? Is it just me? And eventually you go, well, why don't I just make Monday the cheat day? And so you have the second row. And then you go, you know, there's no need to eat chocolate on a Tuesday. I'll have Tuesdays on a Monday as well. And before you know it, that entire slab, come on, is anybody else a slab eater at the end of every evening? Put your hand up. We'll pray for you. We'll do a salvation appeal, and you will get saved and delivered in Jesus' name. Like, when is enough enough? It's kind of like, like watching series. You know, when... I mean, when last did you say to yourself, you know, okay, there's this new Netflix series that's coming out, and I, I'm, as God as my witness, only two episodes a night. Two episodes. How many of you know that two episodes becomes three, becomes four, becomes two o'clock in the morning, 
3 o'clock in the morning. By the time you hit 4 o'clock in the morning, you may as well stay awake because you've got to be up at 5 anyway for work. Can I get an amen? amen? Like at what point do you go, enough is enough? When is enough enough? When, when do we tell ourselves that this is enough? I remember, you know, as a parent, there's going to be times in your life when your kids are squabbling and you're going to tell them, enough is enough. You guys can tussle, you can fight, but there's a certain point when enough is enough. When I was growing up, the enough was enough was really at the point where my mother said, do not bother me. I do not care about your fighting. I don't want to hear about your bickering. You can do whatever you want to each other. And the only time I'm going to climb in and tell you to stop is when blood is drawn. Can I get an amen from any other parent? Okay, I'm still traumatized from our past. Like, when is enough enough? When is enough likes on social media enough? When is enough enough? When are all your trophies on your closet? When is it enough? When is enough money enough? Okay, that one's never. But when is enough enough? You know, as I begin to think about this question, I, I guess some of the other questions that we need to ask ourselves outside of just these surface level things is things like, when have I done enough? When am I good enough? When do I have enough? When am I liked enough? When is enough enough? And yes, the problem when it comes to contentment is that contentment isn't the natural heart's resting place. It's not the natural heartbeat of the average human being. You know, all of us have a, what we call a resting heart rate. If you have a smartwatch, you will know all about a resting heart rate. Some of you monitor it every single day. My resting heart rate when I'm training a little bit is about 47 beats a minute. For some of you, maybe 50 or 60 or maybe 100, 120. You need to see a doctor. Is there a doctor in the house? But there's a natural resting heart rate that every single person has. And what I've learned about life is that contentment isn't the natural resting heart place. You've got to work really hard in order to make it the natural resting heart rate of your life. Proverbs chapter 27 frames it like this. It says, Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so the human desire is never satisfied, never satisfied. Somebody once said this, in some ways the human heart is like a whining toddler who if left by itself will never be satisfied. When is enough enough? Uh, what, is, what does discontentment bring? Why, why is discontentment such a bad thing for our lives? Let me give you a couple of things that discontentment brings so that we can understand why we need to resist it and fight against it. First of all, discontentment brings more fatigue on your life. Proverbs chapter 23 says this, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise to know when to quit. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. You can replace it with anything else. When enough isn't enough, don't wear yourself out trying to achieve these things. Don't wear yourself out trying to grasp. Don't wear yourself trying to go for things. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Why? Because discontentment brings more fatigue. The more discontent you are, the more tired you become. Discontentment brings more expenses. I mean, you know, it always costs more to have more. Somebody once said this. They said, I used to dream of the salary I'm now starving on. You know, sometimes I go to, uh, I, I go to some of the young guys, some of the teenagers, I, I, I go to my own kids and they go, you, you, you know, what, what salary would you, if you had to earn this salary, you would go, I'm doing really well. And you know what the average teenager will tell you? If I could earn about 8,000 rand a month, I'm going to be flying. I'm going to have a car and a house and a mansion and a place by the sea. Like they have no concept. You ask that to a young adult and you'll be amazed at some of the answers. But it's amazing how the things that you dreamed of, once you get there, suddenly are never enough. 
it brings more expenses. Discontentment brings more anxiety to your life. Creates a sense of anxiety when you're never feeling like enough is enough. Discontentment brings conflict into your lives. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 27 says, Greed brings grief to the whole family, but those who hate bribes will live. Greed brings grief to the whole family. Family, come on, some of us have grown up in spaces or places where all that our parents wanted to do is just earn more and more and more, and their excuse was, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. But it's never quite enough. Eventually, it creates conflict. Come on, how many of you know that, um, um, that money so often, and this is not just about money, this is anything in your life, but it can create huge conflict. When somebody, when somebody passes away and there's family involved, it's going to bring conflict when it comes to the inheritance. I always say that an inheritance is never anything you deserve, so why fight over it? Yet we can't help ourselves because even though we know that we're going to get something, that something is never enough when we're comparing it to other people who are going to receive something within it. It can bring conflict, conflict to your soul. It can also bring more dissatisfaction in life. But ultimately, I think the greatest disease that discontentment brings is it brings mental health issues. It brings mental health issues. Why? Because discontentment is always me-focused. And whenever my life becomes me-focused, it will always lead to mental health issues in our lives. Do you know why people are struggling with mental health. I'll tell you one of the primary reasons is discontentment. You go, no, that's not true. There's all sorts of other things. I'm telling you, discontentment. We're living in a world where we're never satisfied. We're living in a world where enough is never enough. We're chasing, we're striving, we're anxious, we're fatigued, we're tired, we're conflicted, and ultimately these things play on our mind and it can create mental health issues in our lives. So, what is contentment? What is contentment? Well, the definition of contentment is a state of happiness and satisfaction, or the state of being mentally or emotionally satisfied with things as they are. Uh, Stoic philosophers of past used to believe this. They used to have this phrase they said, that says, if you want to make a man happy, add not to his possessions, but take away from his desires. Don't add to your possessions. Take away from your desires. True happiness is not the addition, but it's subtraction. This doesn't even make sense in our modern age. That contentment can be subtraction and not addition. But I think that this is so true. Natasha Crane said this, While gratitude is a measure of our perspective on the things we already have, Contentment is the measure of a perspective on things that we don't have. So often we spend our lives saying, I want to be grateful, but actually contentment is the perspective of things that we don't have in life. An old Japanese proverb said this, even if you sleep in, in a thousand mat room, you can only sleep on one mat. There's a story that I read about. It goes like this. Said, There's a tale of a king who suffered from a painful ailment. His counselors advised him of the only cure, to find a contented man, get his shirt, and wear it night and day. So the king sent messages to find such a man with orders to bring back his shirt. After months of searching the kingdom, they returned empty-handed. Did you find a contented man in all my realm? Asked the king. Yes, O king, we found only one in all your realm, they replied. Then why did you not bring back his shirt, the king demanded. Master, the man had no shirt. Okay, some of you got that one. <laughs> now, let me just put a disclaimer here. That contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not a lack of ambition. Contentment is not sitting around and doing nothing all day and going, I'll just let the world fall around, apart around me and I'm going to do nothing because I am just content in my bubble. Contentment isn't a lack of, compl isn't complacency. We, we need to be ambitious in life. 
We, we, need to, we need to desire things in life. We need to press into things. We need to have some goals in life. We need to have some things that we're looking forward to in life. So contentment isn't complacency. You know, I love the fact that last week Sunday you had a vision offering, a vision offering. I love the fact that at this church we go, hey, we know that we receive and we're grateful for the generosity of the church, but we want to continue to stretch and grow because even though we're grateful for what God has given us, yeah, we know that God has got so much more. We know that there's a world to reach. We know that there are people that need to find hope and people that need to find healing. We know that we can do greater things through this church. And so it's not a lack of complacency, but it's a resting heart rate that we have in our lives where we're not constantly chasing things and we're in a state of discontentment. So where does discontentment come from? Let me give you three areas where discontentment comes from. Number one, discontentment is an identity issue. It's an identity issue. Why is it an identity issue? Because when it comes to discontentment, it's a worth issue. We're always trying to keep up with everybody else. Come on, we all know the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses. And so we're always looking at what we don't have, and we're always chasing those things because we have to keep up with life. We have to keep up with society. If you've got 10 followers, I need to have 12. If you've got 16 followers, I need to have 18. If you've got 24 likes on this post, I need to make sure that I get 30 likes on this post. Come on, can I get an amen yet today? And we look at everybody else's holidays, we look at everybody else's family life, we look at everybody else's things that they're doing and expeditions that they're going on, and we look and we go, is my life matching up to theirs? And so it's an identity issue because we're never confident and satisfied within ourselves, but we're always looking for our identity in comparison to other people, what others have, what others do, where others go, and we try and find out our identity in those things. The second area where discontentment comes from is that it is a greed issue. Discontentment is a greed issue. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says this, keep your life free from the love of money and content with what you have, for he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Keep your life free from the love of money, not from money. You can't keep your life free from money. You need some money in your bank account. Can I get a good amen here today? But keep your life free from the love of money and content with what you have. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. So discontentment is a greed issue that we sometimes have to deal with. The third thing is that discontentment is a spiritual issue, spiritual issue. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 25, listen to this, says this, the righteous, the righteous has enough. Who has enough? The righteous person, the Bible says, has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. So the Bible says here that discontentment is actually a spiritual issue. Why? Because righteous people have enough. Wicked people always want more. And so part of our evaluation in our own lives is we need to look and go, How, what is the default of my life? What is my resting heart rate? Is it a place of enough or is it constantly the want of more? Because if it's enough, the Bible says you're a righteous person. But if every single day you're chasing, you're wanting, you're needing, you're not satisfied, the Bible says that this is actually a spiritual issue. This is not something that we deal with in the natural. This is something that we have to repent from. We have to turn away from. We have to deal before God with. Because it's not just something that we fulfill or satisfy in our life. It's something that takes away from our lives. It takes away from our spirituality. And we need to deal with it as a spiritual issue in our lives. 
Do you know that discontentment is actually one is a sin and it's one of the Ten Commandments? Because one of the commandments says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You should not covet. Why do we covet? Because we are discontent. It's amazing that this commandment sits right alongside things like do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery. Isn't it amazing how there's not a single person yet today that goes, yes, if somebody steals, they need to face the consequences. If somebody kills, they need to go to jail. Like we, we would all agree with that. But somehow we allow covetousness just to continue to linger and manifest in our lives. Because, well, it's not stealing. I'm not, I, I'm not hurting anybody. I, I, I didn't kill anybody, so I guess it's okay. No, but it's one of the Ten Commandments right alongside all of those things. And what that says to me, which it should say to all of us, is we should take it just as seriously as every one of those other commandments. Discontentment will kill your soul. It's a spiritual issue that causes damage to your soul. Now, I spent 25 minutes telling you all the bad news. You want some good news this morning? You want to feel lifted up this morning? Okay. The good news is this, is that contentment is an art that can be learned. Contentment is something that can be learned. It may not be your natural resting heart rate, but it is something that you can learn in your life. This is what Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter 4. Paul, if you know anything about the book of Philippians, Paul wrote it from jail. Paul was in a hardship moment in his life. Not the first time, many times Paul faced hardship. If you read Paul's uh, biography and you read his CV, you will know that Paul went through many perilous times in his life where he was beaten, whipped, shipwrecked, hungry, left for dead. And in the midst of all of this, Paul is writing this beautiful letter in the book of Philippians where one of the primary themes is the theme of rejoicing. The word joy or rejoice occurs more than 10 times in the book of Philippians, even though it's just a few chapters long. And in the midst of Paul's, one of Paul's greatest crises, he had learned, the Bible says, the secret of being content. And Paul's writing this not as a, a philosophical idea. He's not writing it as a piece of theoretical work. Paul has a deep revelation that in the midst of every season in his life, he had discovered something so profound and so powerful that it didn't matter what situation he found himself in, he could have extreme joy and total contentment. And so Paul says this. He says, I've, in the midst of all of this, I have learned the secret of being content. I've learned the secret. That word content in the, in the Greek means to be contained or self-sufficient. It's a description of a man whose resources are completely within him, so he doesn't have to depend on anything externally. In other words, in other words, you can live life where everything that is within you is more than enough. You don't have to look to anything on the outside to fulfill any kind of a void that you think you have in life because you've learned that everything you need is contained within. Come on, how do you know that's a deep revelation? So Paul says, I've learned the secret. That word learned, he, he, he repeats it twice. And both times is a slightly different Greek word that he uses. The first time he uses it, the word learned simply means this, I've learned by experience. In other words, what Paul was saying was that I have had to go through some difficult experiences in my life in order to learn how to be satisfied. Contentment isn't found in the good times of your life. You know, it's like, it's like you know, when you go to that Christmas dinner and you've eaten way beyond what you should be eating and you undo the belt bucket and you undo your button and you let it all just 
expand out and you sit on the couch lazily and you have this deep sense of contentedness, which leads to a lot of pain afterwards. But in the moment, you, have, you are content. And everybody can be content when the chips are up. When you know that you're getting to the end of the year and you've had a good year and you realize that you could probably get a bonus at the end of this year. You've met your targets. You've earned more than enough. You can pay yourself a bonus if you're a business owner. And so you know that things are going well and it's easy in those moments to be able to go, hey, I'm good. Amen? But what Paul is saying here is, I've learned by experience. I've learned by experience because I've been through good times and I've been through bad times. And in my experience of all the seasons that I've been through, I've learned. I've learned. The second time he uses the word learned is actually a slightly different way. And that's why it says in the second time, I've learned the secret. Because the second Greek word that he uses there actually means to be initiated into the secret. It was a word that was used actually by ancient pagan religions with reference to their inner secrets. You know, these philosophers in these pagan religions, and they would learn these things, and then they would want to impart them like this inner secret. And what Paul was saying here by using that word is that I have come to a deeper revelation of the contentedness of life. It's not an inner secret that is unattainable by people, but Paul is saying, I've had to learn it through experience, and through experience, I come to the place of revelation that I can be satisfied no matter what. I have learned the secret of being content. So what was Paul's secret? It was very simple. He said it in the last phrase there. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And what Paul is simply saying here is that through all the trials, through all the temptations, through all the difficulties of life, it is Christ who satisfies, who fills me, who brings contentedness, who helps me to live a life that is more than enough, more than I need, more than I could ever ask or imagine as the book of Ephesians. Why? Because it's the power of Christ within him that gave him spiritual contentment so that he could live a life that was completely satisfied. I've learned the secret. I've learned how to overcome the natural resting heart rate of life, to bring myself down to a resting heart rate through learning, through experience, through trials, through tribulations, not just when I'm on the mountain top, but even in the valleys of my life, I've learned the power of satisfaction in my life. Come on, how many of you would do better to be more content today? How many of you wish that you could go into another year feeling a little more content than you were this year? How many of you are tired and fatigued and worn out and burnt out? How many of you have some mental health challenges simply because you're chasing things that you were never designed to chase? You're pursuing things that you were never designed to pursue because you're looking for self-worth, you're looking for affirmation, you're looking for satisfaction on everything that's on the external where Christ's secret for you and I is that what we have on the inside is more than enough to live a satisfied life. I've learned. And I want to suggest to you and I today that we learn, that we learn, that we don't just hope, that we don't just wish that maybe next year will be a better year. Maybe next year I'll be happier. Maybe next year I'll be more satisfied. Because wishful thinking is never going to get you there. But what Paul is saying here is, I've learned, I've learned the inner secret. How? Through Christ, who gives me strength. So, how do we learn contentment? Let me give you four things quickly as we come to a close. Are you ready for it? Number one, learn to develop a grateful heart. Learn to develop a grateful heart. Because a grateful heart is a healthy heart. But the question is, where do you learn gratitude? 
And again, the answer is through trials and tribulations. Have you ever noticed that gratitude is never learned when you have stuff? The only thing that when you have stuff is that you seem to have this insatiable one for more stuff. But actually it's through the trials and hardships that you truly learn gratitude. It's when things are taken away, when things are stripped away from you, that you begin to develop a grateful heart for the things that you do still have for the people that you still love, for the things that really matter in your life. Can I encourage you today that it doesn't matter what season you find yourselves in, develop gratitude for the things you have. Now, you can do the Oprah Winfrey thing. You can take a journal and write down three things every single day. But may I propose that the better way to do it is to do it before the Lord. Do it before, come before the Lord. Start your prayer time with gratitude. Start your prayer time thanking God and blessing God for the things that He has bestowed upon you. And maybe you, like Job, have had everything taken away from you. Well, I'll tell you the one thing that the devil can never re- rob from you is the work that Jesus did on the cross for you and I. And if that was all that God ever did for you and I, Would that be enough? My prayer is that we learn the secret of that being enough. If Jesus never added anything else to my life, would the simple fact that he paid the highest price, gave his life for me, be enough for me to be grateful every single day? Number two, learn to find your worth in God. Learn to find your worth. Develop a grateful heart. But then find your worth in God. Tim Jackson from the University of Surrey said this. He said, we spend money we don't have on things we don't need to create impressions that won't last on people we don't care about. Isn't that so true? We're always chasing. We're always looking for our worth. We're always checking social media. We're always looking at what the car the neighbor's driving, what other people have, the clothing industry that makes you change is no longer just seasonal clothing changes. It's weekly. Today it's skinny jeans. Tomorrow it's wide jeans. And the next day it's flare jeans. And then it's no jeans. (laughs) And who knows what? They have to keep reinventing to keep you on the hamster wheel Because they understand human psychology of keeping the chase going, keeping us hungry, rather than finding contentedness and finding our worth in God. Find your worth in God. Get before God. Find yourself in Him. Number three, learn to be satisfied with what you have. One of the ways that I challenge myself in this, and I don't always get this right. But before I want to purchase anything new, the question I ask myself is, am I content with what I already have? It's such a powerful way to live if you can really do that. If I can't get this, can I still be happy? Because if I can't be happy and I want to get it, it's going to lead me down a rabbit hole if I'm not careful. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have things just because you want. (laughs) You know, life can also be enjoyed. But the danger is that we're always chasing because of a lack of satisfaction. Rather than taking a hold because of the blessing and the overflow, we're chasing out of need. But maybe, may I propose that the next time that you want to chase after something that you don't really need, but it's something that you want, first resolve in your heart that I'm satisfied with what I currently have. Because if you can learn that kind of a lifestyle, it becomes easier to make the right decisions in your life that lead to contentedness. Number four, as I close, learn to live below your means. Learn to live below your means. You know that 
the Bible gives us one of the most profound ways to do this. Do you know how the Bible teaches us to do this? It's through tithing. Tithing not only honors God, but it teaches us to live below our means. It teaches us that we don't always have to grasp at every last cent. And one of the things that I teach our church often to do is that the wrong question that we sometimes ask as we do life is, can I afford it? That's the easy question to ask in life. The better question to ask is, am I being a good steward of it? Because just because you can afford something doesn't mean you're being a good steward. And when we're not good stewards and we start to chase, we're going to get led into the trap that ultimately doesn't lead to satisfaction and contentment, but leads to discontentedness and brokenness and mental health issues in our lives. But if we can learn to be content, if we can learn that just because I got it doesn't mean I need to have it, and we can learn to be good stewards of what God has placed in our hands, we will learn how to be more content. Come on, has this helped you this morning? I'm going to ask you all to stand your feet. I want to pray with us here this morning as we close. Just bow your heads for a moment. And, you know, as I thought about this message for this morning and why do I want to preach it and I was asking Sven, what have you been covering over the last while? And a lot of it has been about vision and heart for the house and all of those things. But I realize also that we're closing in on a year. And if you're anything like me, every single year as I get towards the end of the year, I begin to run just kind of in my subconscious. This idea of, am I satisfied? Have I achieved? Am I content? Or am I running into the year dissatisfied and constantly chasing? And my prayer for every single one of us today is as we wind down this year and you've been through ups and downs and highs and lows and you may be in the greatest season of your entire life or you could even be in the most challenging season of your life. But that as you wind down this year and you move into another year, that you will be able to shift your resting heart rate. You know, they say that a lower resting heart rate is a healthier heart rate because the fitter you get, the lower your heart rate gets. And we have to learn to lower our heart rate of discontentment. It leads to health, spiritual health, emotional health, physical health. And my prayer is that as we move into a new year, that we will truly find contentment in our lives. I've learned, Paul said, I've learned the secret of being content. How could Paul in the middle of one of the most difficult situations of his life where it felt like everything was stripped away. How could Paul be so full of joy? This is not pie in the sky. This is a gift that God has for every single one of us here today as we find it in Christ. Come on, can I pray with you? Father, we come to you today. I pray, Lord, that as we look to you, that we will truly discover the power of contentedness in our lives. Lord, discontentment can be so destructive, stress us out, create so much baggage in our lives. But God, you want us to be free. I pray that we will truly find freedom in you as we discover this in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God a hand? Amen. We really hope that you enjoyed that incredible message from Pastor Sean Phillips. We really hope that it spoke to you in the season that you're in. And we're going to take this time now to continue to worship God with our giving. 
We're very passionate about offering and giving back to God at Revive Church. We believe that it is a step of faith, trusting God with what He's given us and trusting that He is our provider. So if you would like to give back to God now, to partner with Him in building His kingdom so that more people can come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, now is your opportunity. If you look in the caption below, our link is there. You can, it'll take you to the website where you can find out how you can give. And we encourage you to pray. Ask God to lead you in this. Otherwise, we hope to see you in person. Our service is on 9.30 a.m. every Sunday morning at Sunningdale Primary School. So we really hope to see you there. Otherwise, we'll see you again online next week. God bless.